Thank you very much. Okay, um, very, very different sort of topic, but uh, let's see how we go with it. Um, I remember I've, I haven't got my slide changes. I remain. First, what is an, uh, an analogy? If you go to the internet, you'll find there's an enormous amount of academic stuff. Uh, a lot of people are for it, some people are against it. Um, but basically, it's using something that is understood, which you call the analog, uh, to explain something that is not understood, which is the target. And uh, of course, analogies don't always work, as a lot of people will be able to tell you, some of them do. But they generally fail when uh, it's the analog is too complex or is not understood either. Um, it's wrong, in other words, you're embedding a misconception, which is a very common uh, mistake that is, that's made, and it's taken too far. So in other words, you've got an, a good analogy, but you've used it, and it's no longer valid. The famous one, of course, is river, the, the sort of river of time. If I look upstream, can I see the future? I mean, you know, it doesn't kind of work. Um, so using analogies, uh, that, as I said, they can be used or abused. Um, but I think it's very important that whenever you're using an analogy, that you interact very strongly with whoever you're doing this teacher-student relationship, explain very carefully what the analogy is and why and how it works. Um, I believe they serve a purpose. They really can be quite useful, although um, they can fail. And you, one has to be very careful on that particular point. Um, and this is the, the one of the keys is the prior knowledge that you have. Um, a lot of analogs or, or, or sort of target groups, you miss the, miss the whole thing because the, the knowledge you're using is not understood. So here's an example. What does snake taste like? Well, if you say like crocodile, it's completely pointless if you've never eaten crocodile. Right? It's an analogy that doesn't work. If you were to say, oh, it tastes like chicken, that would probably work if that would have to be true, which it isn't, but you know, you could sort of do that sort of thing. So prior knowledge is fundamentally important. And here's some analogies, and remember that none of these are, are perfect. Um, they all have flaws, and they only serve to illustrate a particular point. And quite often I say people tend to extend them too far. Now I'll try and point out some failures as and when we go along. Right, measuring distances is a, is a common thing. The question is often asked, how far is it to wherever you want to go? And in order to answer that question, uh, we often use time. It's, you know, whatever it is. Uh, if you ask how far is the nearest garage, it's oh, it's about five minutes down the road. But it depends entirely on the, the questioner, whether they are walking, cycling, or going by car. If you say five minutes and the guy's in a car, um, you know more or less how far it is from your own personal experience. So you can use that analogy. But the interesting one, interesting incident happened in 2000 in Manchester at the International uh, Astronomical uh, General Assembly. Hans Zinnig is an astronomer and he and his friend wanted to go, it was in Manchester, they wanted to go and visit Old Trafford. And they asked the university porter at the, where we were staying, um, you know, <clears throat> how far is it to Old Trafford? And he, without the blink of an eyelid, he replied, four pounds. Because he knew they weren't going to walk, walk. he also knew they weren't going to take the bus. So they were going to take a taxi, and a taxi in you was four pounds. So there's another way of measuring, <laughs> measuring distance, all right? But you've got to understand exactly the context in which that applied. So it was quite a, a funny little incident there. But there are other examples. For example, this is one I've used at, at school level for various things, and I just roll them up here. Um, that if you go from Musenberg, uh, the distance is 10 kilometers. You take about two hours to walk there. 10 minutes by car, and these are sort of ballpark figures, one minute by jet and by shuttle, at the turbo boosted speed of 36,000 kilometers per hour, it makes the number easy, um, you know, it takes about a second. And then of course you can go to Sutherland, all these various distances. And we'll see later on that we really don't have much of a concept of a thousand. We don't really understand how big a thousand is. Um, for example, when you say to people how long it takes to drive in a motor car to the sun at a speed of 100 kilometers an hour, and you get some answers like, ooh, uh, a couple of months, maybe a few years. In fact, it takes 171 years okay, to drive there. And that's, the idea here is to actually give people some semblance of distances because they do understand what the, how long it takes to travel in a car. Of course, um, these, some of these are obviously a bit silly, like the moon one, because that's a direct course. So they're just ballpark figures, but it gives some idea of time. 
Now this is a very famous uh, problem. The distance is defined as the spatial separation at a common time. So now that when we normally talk about how far it's from here to Johannesburg, I'm talking about today and I'll get to Johannesburg later on today or tomorrow, whatever it is. So we're talking about the same time. But of course when you start talking about uh, distant galaxies, like if a galaxy is 9.1 billion light years away and the universe is 13.7 billion years old, how come it got so far away in just 4.6 billion years? Okay? And um, the, dif the difference comes in you confusing distances with times. And it makes no sense to talk about the difference in spatial positions of a distant galaxy as seen when it was 9.1 billion light years away, or years ago, rather, um, than when your galaxies are moving relative to each other. So the analogy, <coughs> really, redshift is the only one that gives you something that's unambiguous and correct. Here's an analogy. If the SR Blackbird, which you know is a very fancy supersonic plane that the Americans had, is flying overhead of Mach 3, you hear the sound 30 seconds later, this, uh, the answer to the question, how far away is it, is not what you clearly think is 30 uh, sound seconds or 10 kilometers. Um, because, of course, the thing's moved. By the time you get the sound, it's already moved on further already again, so you can't give that distance like that. It's a good analogy, but it requires a lot of prior knowledge. Why 10 kilometers? Well, sound travel is around about 3 seconds or 3 kilometers per second. So 30 sound seconds would be 10 kilometers. But also you need to know what that aeroplane is. You also need to know what Mach 3 means. So this is an analogy that works, providing you understand what it's all about. But this whole idea of confusing light years and uh, or, or billion years ago or so many light years away, that confusion, um, this by the way comes to a chap called Ned Wright who gives a very good article on it about press releases and these sort of things. Uh, of course if you go to the universe, uh, then if you talk about distances, then the distance across the visible universe is about 93 billion light years, but it's only 13.7 billion years old. And I think that's the important distinction we need to make. We also use intermediary standards quite frequently, um, and these are very useful. So when we're judging distances, we use things that we know as a bracketing process. So for example, um, we use things we're familiar with. If, for example, you play a lot of cricket, you would know how many cricket pitches something was away. If you were a sprinter, you'd know whatever distance you're running and so on and so forth. So you use things that you understand. But how about numbers? And here's, I've done this over many years, how big is a million or a billion? So I decided to do an exercise and try it. So here's a standard uh, two liter ice cream box, we all know them. Now, how many one rand coins can I fit into that box? Come on. How many one rand coins can I put in? I've, I've physically done this, by the way. I went to the bank and they allowed me to put coins into an ice cream box. Um, <laughs> sorry? About 100. About? In the thousands. Yeah, in the thousands. Any ideas? 700. 700? Well, <laughs> it's 4,000, give or take. All right, 4,000 rand and one rand coins. So what's a million is 250 tubs, or about a cubic meter. So a cubic meter of coins, one rand coins, is about a million rand. So that would make a billion rand um, about a thousand cubic meters, um, which is, if you in, in sort of broad take, about the volume of an average house. All right, a thousand cubic meters. Define so, hey, define billion. I, uh, well, I really brought about a point billion. I, I, I know I don't want to waste too much time on the slides, but uh, I think the modern accepted value of a billion is a thousand million, as opposed to the English billion billion or million million. Rather. So um, I'm talking about a thousand million here. So that's about that many. Go and there's a really sobering thought uh, that comes out is that a lifetime of 70 years is about 2.2 billion seconds. So you could actually physically not count out. A million, a billion coins in your lifetime, all right? If you did it whole full time, because you need to sleep and eat as well. So that's the idea of some numbers. So a billion, in fact, is a very, very large number. Um, so okay, all right. The atmosphere. This is an exercise you great want to do with children. 
in schools or even adults. Um, <clears throat> how thick is the Earth's atmosphere? Get to draw a circle for the Earth and then get to draw a circle for the atmosphere. And the probability is, and I've done this over many, many years, you get something that's about that big. All right? That's quite common. Um, for those who think about it a bit more, they may come with something about that sort of size. Um, and eventually, you finish up with the correct answer, which is about there. You can just see a very thin layer around that. Um, if you then talk about, well, where's the orbit of something like the International Space Station, you get that. They know it's outside the atmosphere, so you get that there. There's, there would be the there would be the orbit of the of the ISS, but in fact, it's about there. Because don't forget, the ISS is about 400 odd kilometers above the Earth's surface, and um, the Earth is about 12,000 or 13,000 kilometers across. So it's a very thin layer. And the analogy there, would be if you take a soccer ball and imagine the soccer ball is the size of the Earth then if you put a sheet of paper on the soccer ball, an A4 sheet of paper, that represents the thickness of the Earth's atmosphere. It gives you some idea how little it really is. Okay? And as proof of that, here's a picture taken from the ISS, sunrise from the ISS, and there's your thin layer of the atmosphere. It really is very, very thin. Of course, one can start debating about where does the atmosphere actually end. Um, it doesn't sort of go up and point, there's, there's the end of it, it sort of fades out gradually. But you can say that effectively the effect of atmosphere is around about 150 or so kilometers. Often you're asked, why do all the planets orbit the Earth, or orbit the Sun rather, in, in a single plane? And you can talk about the evolution of the, of the solar system and all that spinning stuff. Um, but you can. Um, do a very simple exercise, taking a tennis ball and sticking it in water, taking it out and spinning it. And of course, um, all the droplets come out in an equatorial plane, and you can say, well, that's, if something spins like that, then you'll find all these objects there. But this is a very tricky one, because of course, the droplets um, they are, don't take it, in, you can't use the droplets as planets, because unlike the planets, of course, the droplets spiral outwards, whereas the planets orbit in fixed orbits. So, but it does, all you're trying to illustrate here is that they, the droplets come out in an equatorial plane. Planets do not, the droplets do not represent planets and you've got to stress that. Um, so, uh, because otherwise you, it really gets kind of tricky. But it works for accretion disks around black holes and white dwarfs and everything else as well. Accretion disks sort of form in the equatorial plane for the same reason. There's a nice picture showing you why planets aren't little droplets. Okay, core collapse supernova. Here I've got to do a little demonstration. Sorry, it's a bit of fun. Um, I forgot to take this out earlier. Now we all know, I think, that um, when the stars are mass from between 8 and 40 solar masses, when they eventually die, they go up as a type 2 supernova where the, you have a, the core um, collapses, it stops at iron and if the core is greater than 1.4 solar masses then electron, it starts just collapses. You have this cataclysmic explosion and which is halted by the neutron degeneracy and they bounce outwards and this is a very well known demonstration you get a basketball and a tennis ball and just bounce the two together to show people that they have nothing special bouncing and then of course you drop them together and the one bounces up. But you can extend that because that works very nicely for two particles. But what happens if you've got more than one particle and there's something as a Galilean cannon, this works better. And I'll do it here, I'll demonstrate this. This consists of a series of super balls and a little super ball at the top which I'm going to plonk in here. And I'm not going to drop it from very high, because it, if I do this outside from here, it'll go about 50 odd meters. Um, so I'll drop it from right down here, and um, very low, but just watch where the little ball goes. All right? Um, so you can, you can demonstrate that, and of course you can imagine that if that... Um, if in the core collapse system you've got millions of particles, one bouncing off the other, the actual bounce velocity at the end is thousands of kilometers per second. 
Um, so <clears throat> this is another nice little analogy. Um, whoops. Um, this is Wheeler's idea that if matter tells space how to curve, and then if you take something around that, you will get curved space tells matter how to move. And there's a very nice demonstration that I did when I first came to the observatory. I had a big rubber sheet with a shot put in the middle, painted yellow to represent the sun, and then I launched marbles and other objects on this ramp here, and they could see that how orbits and things moved depending on the curvature in the middle. So it works quite nicely. And, of course, uh, for black holes, this is one that I've used, and again, it's an analogy which has problems, but it does sort of work. If you imagine ants walking across a magic rubber sheet with infinite elasticity, then as they get to the middle there, they'll go slightly quicker in and slightly slower out, so they depress it a bit further. That extends a bit further, and eventually you get the situation here whereby as fast as the ants are trying to climb out, the elastic or the rubber sheet is going down. So what goes in never comes out. Now that sort of gives you some explanation as to why that happens, um, but I said it's an analogy that can be used in conjunction with many other aspects of it. But the main thing is that often a black hole is shown as this sort of thing and you, people get the impression that a black hole is like a hole in a piece of paper. And that's not where it goes at all. It's actually a ball, okay? And it's very difficult to conceive a ball that everything falls into a ball. It's kind of hard, but that's the truth of the situation. And then wormholes, of course, are great for science fiction. Uh, black hole here, everything comes out. Sorry, nothing comes out. And white hole here, and nothing goes in. And then, of course, it's great for Star Trek and things like that, but it's kind of remote from proper science nowadays and so on. So there's, but that's a wormhole and quite fun to do. Now there's another exercise which is great for little kids. Uh, why don't I fall off the earth? And you can do this um, without using gravity because that runs into problems. Just use up and down. You get a sheet of A4 paper, you draw it up like that and then what really works well with little children and they can draw uh, anything they like on that piece of paper. Um, whatever goes up, houses, trees, and down below you can have worms and mines and wells and all sorts of other things. And eventually they would cut along this line here and along the line there. You would then lay it on the ground, making a circle, and then each segment is shown on the ground like that. And down is always towards the center, and up is always away from the center, so that's why they don't fall off the earth. And you haven't used at any stage have you used gravity or anything complicated like that. So the little four, five, six-year-olds, uh, that's why they don't fall off the earth. Because no matter where they are, down is always towards the center. Even if they're, at, even if they're down here at the bottom, down <coughs> is that way. So towards the center. So that sort of helps in a way. This, this often leads on to the um, idea of the expanding universe. And this is one the analogy many of us used. Uh, Matthew used it yesterday. The mistake people make quite often, though, as I'll come to in a minute, but if you blow it up, of course, um, don't draw dots on the balloon because the dots expand. You stick little jolly dots on because they stay the same size. Um, when you blow it up, what it really shows, of course, is that um, it, you stick on jolly dots because what you're really trying to show in this particular one here is that no matter where you are on the surface of this balloon, um, things are always moving away from you. Okay, that's really what that's trying to show. It's not trying to show anything else, because what um, the question often comes if you don't emphasize this straight away is that this balloon is not expanding into anything. All right, that's a huge problem when you talk about this thing. Here's a NASA view. They use uh, bread dough with currents in it, and it's quite a nice one. Um, as the as the dough rises, the currents just get further apart. The whole thing gets bigger, and this invariably leads to um, the Big Bang Theory and some horrible analogies and diagrams come out of this. Um, there are lots and lots and lots and lots of diagrams about this. Some of them are really quite poor, like this one. Um, it's uh, the expanding universe, uh, written nice and neatly there. This is the present, and that was the Big Bang. And this leads me to the question like, um, what's it expanding into? The other thing is that that distance, or quite often that, that time there, but as people see that as a distance of 15 billion years or light years. 
Uh, here's another really awful one. Um, that's, uh, you know, that, I mean, it sort of doesn't really explain things. And here they have a radius of 15 billion light years, 14 billion light years, which is completely wrong. Um, so there, there's lots of them. You can, the internet, you've got a million of them. This is real one, really bad one that I came across. Um, does this mean that the Hubble Space Telescope was outside the universe when it photographed these two supernova? Um, and what are these things? Because are they the same as those things, or is an evolution process going on there? Um, and sorry, this was put out by NASA, believe it or not. Um, so it's, it's kind of a confusing diagram, this. Um, this is, I think, the best one that I've seen, where the Big Bang is on the outside. All right, so that is the Big Bang. The idea here being that it's, everything is expanding. The Big Bang is what's expanding. It's not expanding into anything, and that's the present. And then Hubble has a look back thing here to the <coughs> Hubble deep field is about there, and the ultra deep field is there. And recently, we've got the, ex, the ultra deep field, the ex, ex, extra deep field, which is about there. So you're looking back uh, quite a long time. And for those who are interested, it's, that's the XDF field there in comparison to the size of the moon. And that's what it looks like. So that's just sort of sideline interest. Um, I actually used this one yesterday. Uh, I think it's fine to use this sort of diagram providing you're trying to make a point about something. And I use this because um, I was asking the question, can these new super facilities um, explain that? by explaining that. So all I'm trying to do here is trying to say, well, do we need particle physics to explain the expansion of the universe today? But the diagram itself, of course, is um, not the best thing in the world, but it does serve a purpose. This is one that I find very difficult um, because the idea here is that dark matter is always pulling down. If that's the case, was dark energy always there? If it was there, well, the idea here is that the balloon is countering dark matter. Uh, eventually, for some reason, even though dark matter was doing that, we eventually got to there where you had an equilibrium situation. And you've now got an accelerated expansion with lots of forces adding upwards there. But it's not a, to me, it's not a great, great analogy. But if you ex use it very carefully, you can use it to illustrate a point. But it's a bit iffish at times. Then I come to the last little bit. Um, which is, there's been a lot of hysteria recently. Um, yeah, that came from a tweet from somebody that is quite funny. Um, had the Higgs boson really been discovered? And the answer is, of course, no, it hasn't, but they found something that looks like it. Um, why was it found before? Well, there's a lack of energy, and there's a lot of energy that's needed to really get to small pieces. So I've got a simple analogy here about energy and larger small pieces. If you're going slowly, you have a car accident and some big bits fall off like bumpers or fenders. If you go at a higher speed, you might find bits of engine and stuff lying on the road. At a higher speed, you'll find even smaller bits, nuts, bolts, maybe a couple of gears. And at higher speed, you find tiny bits, paint flakes and everything else. So the idea here is that the higher the speed, the more energy is available, so you can see more detail. That's where that sort of works. But of course, the LHC doesn't use cars. It uses protons traveling at effectively the speed of light. Quickly look at fields. In physics, um, we, what are fields? Well, they're a region of space where you can either see uh, they exhibit particular properties. So you could have uh, magnetic fields or various other things. And they're basically split up into three or more. But we'll have a look at two. That's probably the most well-known field. Um, it's actually called a vector field because each particle of this field, each point of this field, has two, force, has two numbers to describe it, namely the direction of the field and the strength of the field. Um, a weather map such as this, which is, has isobars on it, is a scalar field because no matter where you go, one number describes what the pressure is anywhere there. And if you extend that same analogy for a field uh, to a vector field, you get something like this, whereby the pressure gradients will produce winds. So this is a vector field because the winds require direction and speed. This diagram isn't quite right because these arrows should be shorter than those arrows. But anyway, there we go. So 
Um, but that gives you some idea of what vector fields are. The Higgs field, very briefly, is the green thing here. These are all the particles that interact with it. There's a mistake here. This is from Matt Stassler. But the neutrinos, they should, in fact, be in there. But they're very, very light, but they're not massless. Um, but any, basically what happens here is that anything that interacts with the, with the field will get some mass. And there are many analogies to explain that. Um, I'll quickly put these up. Um, the common one is treacle. The other one is a room filled with people. And then there's John Ellis's, and then I have one at the end that I'll quickly show you. Treacle, the idea here is that the universe is filled with some sort of sticky stuff, and when the particle goes through that sticky stuff, it slows down and gets heavier. Um, but I don't quite understand why it gets heavier. There is a resistance to motion, but is the particle acquiring mass? The answer is no. And that's why I have a problem with that particular analogy. The other one um, is this one, which is quite well known. The universe field is a room full of physicists. And Einstein appears. And of course, everybody uh, will clump around him. But I've seen variations of this with Margaret Thatcher, Marilyn Monroe, Justin Bieber, and even a naked woman. Um, <laughs> but the effect is the same, because the, the person who walks in as the particle, people will go around to him or her and speak to them. And the idea is that he, because the people around him, he finds it more difficult to move through, so therefore he has acquired mass um, because of the Higgs field. Well, it's kind of, again, the problem here is, does Einstein get heavier because he's walking through people? And the answer is no. So you can also have what the Higgs boson is. They spread a rumor. All the physicists clump together, and you get that. Um, and that may represent the Higgs boson. <laughs> uh, sort of works. John Ellis, he uses an analogy of, of uh, imagine a snowfield, and this is his famous t shirt, which is the equation, the gradient for the standard model. Um, and he says maybe it's like Siberia, and imagine you're going to move across this by skiing, then <clears throat> you skim across the top, that's like a particle that doesn't interact with the Higgs field, and you go, it doesn't sink into the snow, and it goes very fast. So a particle with no mass will travel at the speed of light. If you have snowshoes, you go across the field and you sink in a little bit. <coughs> you go less than the speed of light and you therefore have acquired <laughs> mass through interacting with the snow field. And if you walk in snow, obviously you get very much slower and that represents a big mass. But again, the same problem arises here is the people walking through the snow don't gain mass. Okay? And... <coughs> The Higgs boson itself would be snowflakes, like the little quantum of energy in a field, which is, okay, that sort of works. Um, that's quite a nice one. Um, but what Peter Higgs said, he had a problem with this, because as far as he is concerned, things like moving through treacle is merely dissipative forces, like I said earlier on. It's just resistance to motion rather than anything else. Um, so <clears throat> I've got a new Higgs analogy. If you imagine this to be a plastic tray containing iron filings. And you can go to a toy shop, you can buy some marbles. You can buy a marble that does not have a magnet in it, and you can buy some marbles with magnets in it, a weak magnet or a strong magnet. And then if you look at the tray from the side, like that, then if you have the marble with no magnet, you give it a bit of speed and roll it across the tray, it gets to the other side at about the same speed, having picked up no iron filings. If, on the other hand, you take the weak magnet, you give it, some, give it a roll across, you guess the other side will have picked up some iron filings, and it will be going slightly slower. And if you go fast, uh, uh, a stronger magnet, it will get the other side much slower, having picked up a great deal more of the iron filings. And then finally, if you want to show the Higgs boson, well, you take your same tray, and you stick the magnet underneath it, and you get the Higgs boson there. And that sort of illustrates to me the, what the field and the interaction of particles gaining mass represents. <clears throat> and that's the end. Thank you very much.